गुड मॉर्निंग Today it is going to be very interesting. What we'll be doing is the combination of anatomy and physiology. So that we'll be learning that much portion of anatomy which will be very useful for our understanding of respiratory system. And then we'll be talking about those uh, respiratory movements also. Because from next time onwards, straight away we'll be going for technical aspects. And yes, I think. Next week, one day we'll be taking the radiology. Thank you, Aksha. Yes, happy Independence Day to everyone. All right, so it's time. Let's start. This is this. That equation that we talked about. Maybe. So let's start. And welcome to respiratory. System. So this would be our action plan for today. So initially, we'll be learning about the anatomy. But this much anatomy, it is like to give you the complete picture. Means next time when I am talking about that, yes, we are talking about the fracture of the anterior end of the, or the fracture of posterior end of seventh rib. So we should be knowing that what exactly are we talking. Why it is that rib is connected at two places in the thorax? Right? What happens to those intercostal spaces? So, if this is the rib and these are the intercostal spaces, so what are the muscles which are lying over there? So that it should not go absolutely bumper when we say that okay, this is the external intercostal muscle or this is the internal intercostal muscles, and because the fibers they are crossing one in one direction, it is like this, and in second direction. For the second muscle, it is like this. So this is something what is called preparing, making the mesh work, which gives protection to the chest. And this foundation will be useful. That what if if someone stabs? If there is a stab injury, right? Chura mara. So when that chura that goes inside, so what can it really do? Right? What if if there is a gunshot injury? In gunshot injury, it happens like the entry wound is usually small and the exit wound is always bigger. It is because the bullet it keeps on rotating, and because of that rotation, it keeps on making the tissue damage bigger and bigger. So that's why in a cross section, it would always look like this. This would be the entry wound, and this one would be the exit. This is two, especially when the snipers are used or when three not three caliber guns they are used. However, in case of pistols, this thing won't be that much true. But anyway, in forensics, when we'll be discussing uh, ammunition, so we'll be talking about all these things extensively, extensively. So this is the basic purpose why we are talking about anatomy, so that we are on the same page of understanding. Right? Let's start. So here is the thoracic wall, respiratory system. That means it is the thorax. Thorax is the thoracic wall, and over here, you'll find only the points, not the lengthy descriptions, just only the points. You need to see two things in this. There is one diaphragm. Think it like this is head, this is neck. So we can say that there is one diaphragm over here, so which is separating the head and neck from the thorax. And then we got the thorax, we got the thorax. And then let's say, let's say the thorax, and then there is abdomen. 
and this is thorax and then. So here is there is another diaphragm. Now this diaphragm, this diaphragm is crisp clear so that you can really watch it. It is separate. Same thing will happen when we'll be moving further. And as we'll be talking about that, this is the abdomen. Now normally we say that abdomen and pelvis one thing. But truly speaking, it would be totally different. So pelvis, pelvis is that area where the reproductive organs, the bladder, they will be there, right? And on the posterior side, there will be the rectum. So this pelvis, so over here, there would be abdo-pelvic. There would be a partition between abdomen and pelvis. And then there is a pelvic floor. This pelvic floor is what is giving protection and this is the pelvic floor. This is the region which we, which everyone needs to be made strong because this is what can lead to so many complications, especially when we talked about that when female birth and after that, all those complications occur. So that's why this is the area which we'll be discussing at length when we'll be talking about abdomen and pelvis, even the anatomy and even the physiology. The physiology of the reproductive system. So over here, this is the beginning. This is the beginning, right? So posteriorly, on the posterior side, backside thoracic part of vertebral column, this is easy to understand. Right? On the backside, there is vertebral column. And anteriorly, we have got the sternum and the costal cartilage. There are so many images, so there won't be any doubt and confusion. The diaphragm which we are talking about, it is made up of all those tissues. So this is what also called as the thoracic, thoracic inlet. This is also called as thoracic inlet because that's where from where the be entering into the thorax. Right? The diaphragm over here, this is freely movable. Yeah, because this is one of the muscles which is used for the quiet respiration. Right? Used for the quiet respiration. So that is thoracic inlet. Just to enter, and this would be the from thorax will be entering into. So anteriorly sternum and costal cartilage. Costal cartilage, the idea is that when we talk about see, this is the vertebra, right? As if we are watching it from the top. And this one is the rib. Now the ribs, this is the sternum. This is the sternum. Ribs, they are not bone all the way from back to front. At one point, they will be converted. They will be cartilage. Right? They will be cartilage. This will be the cartilage. That is what gives flexibility. Right? And this one is the bony structure. This is the bone. So when we'll see the x-ray, can we really say that this cartilage, when the x-rays they try to pass through the bone, they cannot. Because it's bones, they are very thick, very powerful. So they won't permit the x-ray to pass through it. Right? And when the cartilage, they are relatively soft, so X-rays will be able to pass through. So it means we'll be, we should be able to see the interface clearly over here. The difference between the density of bone and the difference in the density of cartilage. So there will be a marked difference. X-rays or the entire radiology is based on the principle of differential density. It means what? It means that let's say anyone who, who is in photography, but uh, what happens when the sunlight, sun is in the background and then we take someone's picture, right? The whole thing looks black, right? Whole thing looks black, totally black, you know, because light is on the back side. So over here, the image would be darker, it will be black and this lining this lining, what we see, it is called as the silhouette. Silhouette, or in simple words, outline. But do remember this word silhouette. This will be coming again and again, especially when we'll be dealing with any of the X-ray chest, even even CT MR will be coming across that. But in X-rays, maximum. So silhouette means what? Silhouette means outline. This is what we really see. It means if I take the x-ray of a circular object, 
So then that circular object will be like this, like, like this. This is a metal, let's say it's a coin. So then a very sharply defined, you would be seeing, sharply defined circle would be seen. Now what if, if on that coin, I put one pin, a small pin, right? A pin, normal pin. So I put it over here. If you take photographs, then you'll be able to see. But for X-rays, no, but they both are metal. They both are metal. We won't be able to see this pin. We won't be able to see this pin because the density of both is same. So when they are overlapping, we won't be able to see. Exactly the way, let's say one person is here and other person standing over here. Now both of them, they are in negative light. Negative light. So now you won't be able to see two persons separately. The whole thing would be looking like one combined outline, something like this. This. So this is what is called as the differential density, the difference in the density. So that's the whole game. So over here, why I explained this is because we'll be watching, we'll be able to watch this particular end. Now that end is anterior end. So do remember that when we talk about anterior end of the rib, that anterior end of the rib is seen away from the vertical. That's the vertebra, that's the central point, and the posterior end is near the vertebra. Am I clear on this? Any doubt, don't worry, tell me again, I will explain. But this is these small things, these are the foundation. So very easy thing. Right? Am I clear? Right? I'll, I'll show you the next series also next week. But such concepts I'll explain. Ah, no problem, I'll explain again. Say, say this. Watching from the top, that's the vertebra, right? On the back side. From here comes the rib. Here is the rib. This rib is bow. As it comes anteriorly, this rib is over. But sternum is at this point. Here is sternum. And the rib is done. Yes, rib is done. So what about rest of the portion? Rest of the portion is cartilage. Is cartilage. That is also a connective tissue, but it is much softer as compared to bone. So this is this rib that is the bone, and this one is cartilage. So if it is cartilage, so it will be seen with a different density. So we won't be able to see that clearly as compared to what our bones were seen. So when you will be taking the x-rays, when you will be taking the x-rays, if this is the sternum, if that's the sternum, you will find that ribs, they will look like this. This is how the ribs are. I mean, this is the rib. Right? This is the rib. This is not in proportion, but just to explain. Right? Otherwise, by this time, the seventh will be back. But this is how they would really look like anterior. So then, are these anterior ends not connected? No, they are connected. But this connection from here onwards it is cartilage. Here onwards, it is cartilage. Here onwards, it is cartilage. So this portion, this portion is cartilage, and that's how they are connected. So when we take X-rays, we'll be able to see these ends. They are called as the anterior end. Correct? They are called as the anterior end. And the posterior end, this one, that would be near the vertebra. Now it is fine. Right? The next is over here. So we saw laterally on the lateral side. Yes, on the lateral side, we have got the ribs and the intercostal spaces, correct. Floor is diaphragm, we just talked about. This is the floor. And roof is supraplural membranes. 
supra pleural mammary supra means above pleura means layer which is covering the lungs right so here are the lungs here are the lungs and lungs are covered by two layers one layer and the second layer this is called as the parietal pleura parietal pleura and this one which is near the organ it is called as the visceral pleura because viscera viscera means organ so this is visceral pleura so we have got the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura again it is not with the real proportion but what i'm trying to explain this this is that this space right, this space there are the lungs there are the lungs this particular space that is what is called as the interpleural space or the pleural space so this is the space which is between two layers of pleura and this is filled with very small amount of fluid so there is a pleural fluid inside there is a pleural fluid and that's how it is generating the negative pressure right. so that is the pleura on the top on the top this pleura it is called as the supra pleura because it is above so supra supra pleural membrane that's how the top is formed so over here diseases of thoracic viscera are the leading cause of death all over the world right thoracic viscera thoracic organs and in thoracic organ two main that is the lungs because lungs cancer carcinoma of lung that is the commonest one and second one is the heart cardiac failure that is one of the major reasons so that's why the disease of thoracic viscera are the leading cause of death all over the world no doubt this is for the history perspective from the history perspective that is whenever you go to clinics like right? i just go through this clinic it's called as inspection palpation percussion and auscultation this is the order in which you will be examining the patient so when you say inspection it is the visual observation you just see the patient right you see so when we'll be learning clinics we'll see that just watch the chest of the patient that which part is automatically moving down right? that is what is called as a apical pulse a apical beat right because the heart is heart is like this this is the area this is the area which is of left ventricle left ventricle is powerful big musculature it beats quite powerfully but truly speaking its movement is something like this right so if this is the chest this is intervertebral space so it is coming and just touching the skin so if you just watch closely you will find that that area is moving like this if the person is fatty right so then that thing would be obscured be covered it would be hidden because of the fat layer but otherwise if the person is bit skinny or even the normal person right you'll be able to see that that movement right? that is like inspection right when you watch when you watch you feel that patient is sitting like this and breathing with a open mouth so that is the indication right you are just watching it Wireless. And why I am using it because uh, I don't have any option. My charging port is destroyed. This one is. So coming back to this. So that was the inspection. Second is the palpation. feeling with foam pressure that is when you touch the patient while patient is that percussion this is the detecting densities detecting densities through tapping so that is like you put this finger and then you try to tap and when you tap when if the inner substance is hollow so then sound will be different if it is foam the sound will be different and the auscultation that is when you use the stethoscope so these are the four methods and in fact this is to be followed exactly in this order right? so it makes your diagnosis much easier inspection palpation percussion and the auscultation so these are some important landmarks important landmarks are 
this is the supra sternal notch all these landmarks you can even feel in your health body right supra sternal notch so that's the sternum this one is the sternum right? this one is the sternum supra sternal that is just above the sternum so that is the supra sternal notch the line which is passing exactly from the middle right it is the mid sternal line makes sense right quite easy mm -hmm. then this is the very important structure the thing what is called is the sternal angle now the sternum is made up of two parts actually three but important parts are two one this is the sternum and this one this portion is called as the manubrium so not written over here i'll write it so this is this is the sternum and this one is called as the manubrium manubrium so that's why the junction of these two it is also called as the manubrio sternal angle right the, the angle between manubrium and sternum or in lovingly it is also called as the sternal angle sternal angle is fine but this sternal angle is a landmark very important landmark and in a minute we'll be just talking about that why it is so important right important from every aspect whether we talk about anatomy or physiology doesn't matter everything is that is important these are done in nipples then there is anterior then there is a mid clavicular line this mid clavicular line means the line which is passing through the midpoint of clavicle and usually it will be passing through the nipples and that is called as the mid clavicular line and then we have got the anterior axillary line axilla means fold right axilla means armpit fold so there are two three lines in fact anterior axillary mid axillary so this is the anterior axillary line. Costal margin, we talked about it last time. But right? this is this is the rib number seven. This one, this one is the rib number seven, and this is the costal cartilage. The so rib number eight, rib number nine, rib number ten. They all would be merging. See, this is seven, then eight, then nine, then ten. They all will be merging, and this level, this, this. That is what is called as the costal margin. This is called as the costal margin. This is ziphy sternal joint because this process, this process, this one, it is called as the ziphoid. It is called as the ziphoid process. Ziphoid process. That is something which you can feel. Just take deep breath and just touch. Just at the base over here, right? Just uske baad to niche abdomen shuru. Right, just at that point, you'll be able to feel the ziphoid process. So we have got the ziphoid process, we have got the manubrium, and we have got the sternum. So very loosely, sternum and manubrium they are considered as one only. So that's the reason this junction is also called as the ziphy sternal joint. Right? Actually, it should be manubrio ziphoid joint, but it's fine. They both are considered as one. And this angle. This angle, this angle, this angle, right? The angle which is formed by two costal margins that is called as the subcostal angle. Right? It is called as the subcostal angle. This angle that is called as the subcostal angle. So these are some important landmarks. On the back side, you'll find that this C7 that is the cervical 7. If you just put the hand behind your neck and then when you'll try to feel ha upper one. Oh sorry, I'm sorry. You are right. Manubrium is shield. My mistake. Right. Thanks, thanks. Thanks. So manubrium is very true. So if you just put back. Ha 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 ha! Right, right, right. So, when you put the hand behind it, right, you'll find a very prominent right, C seven cervical seven, and then there are thoracic all the way, right, and then the lumbar. But the chest is made up of all those thoracic, thoracic vertebrae, right, the cervical there, and the most important bone that is the scapula, and say. Anteriorly, there was clavicle, 
the inferior angle of scapula because scapula is a triangular bone. And this is where we are seeing this posterior axillary line. And the line which is passing through the lower end, the inferior end of scapula, that is also called as the scapular line. So this is this would be the indication that these lines will help us that when we say that okay, we want to go for a for some procedure or we want to go into the lungs, we want to put some needle for the biopsy, what is called as the fine needle aspiration cytology, FNAC. So it is defined that where exactly we shall do puncturing. So this is with respect to the bony prominence which we can feel. The bony prominence which we can feel, so it will become much easier. So this is sternal angle or angle of bleeding. So the manubrium and the sternum manubrium and sternum, this is the manubrium sternal angle, sternal angle, angle of Louis, right, was a French physician and this is the transverse ridge between five, about 5 centimeters below the supra-sternal notch. 5 centimeters means 2 inch. 2 inch means your finger, one digit of your finger is usually 1 inch. So this would be the approximate distance. So that's where you get this manubrium sternal joint or the ridge. And this is the level the most important part. It is the level. This is the level which will be telling you that so many anatomical changes they will be occurring. Right? So it lies at the level of second coastal cartilage. So over here, when we'll see, this is how so this would be rib number two. And so this coastal cartilage number two that can be spot for both sides. And the disc between fourth and fifth thoracic vertebra. So L4, L5, this is a disc between L4 and L5 right on the back side. But if you really take a cross section, you'll find that it is the angle of Louis, sternal angle. It is at this angle, this disc is coming up. Over here, the disc, the disc means when we'll be taking the sections of CT scan, right? So you find that L4, L5, and it is at this level when you find that the rota is changing, trachea is changing, that all those changes. Right? That's why ah, we'll also be keeping one session, one session on X-rays and one session on CT scan and another on MRI. So in CT scan, there will be less of the theory, more of the practical. Once you start understanding all the organs, I'll show you the CT scan. So about how to diagnose. First, our first attempt would be identify the structures. Identify every artery, vein, now muscles, everything. Yes, you'll be able to see that. Right? And then we'll go for the <coughs> diagnosis. Okay. We said that the sternal angle is important. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 eight. So many. Yes, they are. First, the ribs are counted from this level onwards because this is so precise. Now, parallel, start feeling, right? You, you must feel that, that ridge, the prominent ridge. Right? So that is your, your sternal angle. And just literally when you take your hand, you will find that, yes, the two sides, you are, what you are getting is second costal cartilage. Second costal cartilage. And then from that point onwards, you keep moving down and you'll be able to identify, you'll be able to count the ribs. Because you got one important landmark that this is rib number two, postal cartilage number two. So then there would be gaps, so this will be postal cartilage, then the three, then rib number four, then rib number five. And that's how it keeps on going. What thoracic vertebra should be before and Oh, I wrote L5. Achaya, you keep informing me because it happens. Because I was so much involved in Ah, So second quarter is muscle card. In second rib, they lie at. Now the second one.
this is it marks the plane which separates the superior mediastinum from the inferior mediastinum mediastinum is what mediastinum is simple very simple thing mediastinum is this is the thorax this is the thorax right very rough this is these are the lungs right these are the lungs and here is the heart right here is the heart let's see here is the heart this is the heart so everything whatsoever is placed between placed between two lungs that is the mediastinum because right lung right the right lung and the left lung they have occupied this capacity and in between there is space right in between space that thing that thing this in between space that is what is called as the mediastinum mediastinum is that piece of area which is lying between two lungs and in that space in between over here there is there is heart so this area which is above right, that is what is called as the superior mediastinum so it marks the plane which separates the superior mediastinum from the inferior mediastinum so over here this is the level right the superior mediastinum and below it it is called as the inferior mediastinum Now, because mediastinum is something which you watch when you dissect, right? When you dissect, so over here, just by knowing that angle of view, you know that what exactly, where exactly you are, say, marking it, right? So that is. Then C, D, and E. These are actually one and the same thing. What it is? The arch of aorta. Arch of aorta. It goes like this. Right? It goes on like. In fact, the aorta goes like this. So this much portion, this is called as the ascending aorta. Ascending aorta, aorta which is going up. Then there is arch of aorta. So this is called as arch. And from here, this is going down. It is called as the posterior, or the or this posterior situated, or we can say it, we can say it, descending aorta. You can say descending aorta because it is going down, and one in, another thing is that this descending aorta is posterior, ascending aorta is deep. So can you imagine it is going like this? That the when the aorta is formed, that it is not like two D structure, not like this, but it is going like this, starting anteriorly, and then taking a turn, and then going back. Yeah, I'll write it. I'll write it. But just just understand that this is the ascending, ascending ends right, and then the arch starts. So this makes logic that ascending aorta ends at this level. Ascending aorta ends at this level. This is the level, right? So ascending aorta ends. The arch of aorta begins and ends. Arch of aorta begins and ends, and the descending aorta begins. Right? So practically all of them. It is like one concept. This one, the trachea divides into two principal bronchi. So trachea is there. Right? Trachea would be dividing like this. So this is also called as angle of carina. This level, this level, that level is nothing but the level of angle of Lewy. Right. So this is the trachea how it divides. Then we'll be having a zygous vein. Regarding this, as I go through, till we learn anatomy, don't worry about. It. Just think it like that. This is one vein, and it opens into superior vena cava because these azygous veins they will be draining from the lower veins. So they will do all the so that drainage when it is coming right from all the surrounding vessels and everything. So it drains into superior vena cava. This is again important. Pulmonary trunk divides into two pulmonary arteries, like we said last time. This is the pulmonary trunk, and then it goes like this and this it divides. So it divides at this level. Right? It divides. So this is the pulmonary trunk, right? Pulmonary trunk, and on both the sides, the right and the left, it divides. So these are the pulmonary arteries. Right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. 
then they go. It's like the guts. The thoracic duct, once again, which is for the lymphatic system, crosses from right to left side to the level. So we just keep this thing on standby. Keep this thing on standby till we learn, we actually see the thoracic duct. But just remember, a zygous vein, that is one of the vein, and thoracic duct, it is one of the duct which will be major duct, the duct which will be carrying the lymph, right? Lymph, which is important for the immunological function. This one, it marks the upper limit of the base of the heart, the upper limit of the base of the heart, and the cardiac plexuses are situated at this level. This also we'll see. As such, it is makes sense that it is marking the upper limit of the, base of the heart and the plexuses. Plexus means group of nerves. They will be situated over there. But these are the things which we see once we dissect. Right now we are not done dissection, so that's why we just keep keep these points. That is the zygous wing, thoracic duct, and this how the heart is situated, etc. On on the heart. Plexus means group of nerves. Plexus means it is the group of nerves. When these plexuses, when this group of nerves is near the heart, it will be called cardiac plexus. Similarly, when it is near the sacrum, it will be called it sacral plexus. So there, there are several plexuses. Plexus means group of nerves. These group of nerves, they are defined for specific purposes. So that's what we see in the entire body. Now, see this image. From this point onwards, almost there are images only. What, what we see. In this, even if I don't say anything, is this clear that this thing is interior and this one would be the posterior? Can we make it? Yes, because see, here is the, this was what? Many. And this one is sternum. Sternum. So that means it is empty. On the posterior side, as such, if we see this, we really see this, see this, 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 this. They are all what is that? Hmm? What is it? I just remember. This. So that means it is the posterior. So this one is anterior, it is anterior, so that is anterior and this one is posterior. Anterior. So here is the heart, this one is the heart, but what we see is this. This is the ascending node, this one is the arch of and then this is the descending level. A level because we are watching from the side. So see, this is anterior, and this becomes posterior. That's how arch goes. So the ascending aorta, arch of aorta, and then it goes down. So that's why I see there, this one. This one is near the vertebral bone. So that when we take the CT scan, when we take a cross section, so if this, the cross section, let's say one cross section is here and one cross section is here. So in this, can I say that I'll be watching something like there would be one circle which will be anterior if this is the anterior and one circle will is slightly behind this. Because this tube, the tube which was like this was cut at two ends. So it will be looking like this and if I take it over here, so this is the anterior. I won't be getting anything in it. This is posterior. It will be over here. It will be over here. This is the vertical one. This particular, this portion is getting cut. 
Wait, wait, everything to come. So this is the understander how the arch of aorta from anterior to posterior, from anterior mediastinum to posterior mediastinum. This is how it works. That's why this one is that's the trachea. Trachea is identified by classically identified by its rings. See these are the trachea rings. And then it divides. So this is the angle. That is the angle of the loop. So it is at this angle it divides. This is more or less from the anatomy perspective, but what it is trying to explain is the plural reflections. Why you ask questions so late when almost everything is gone? Anyway, this is one lung. This is second lung. The space in between two lungs, this is what is called as the mediastinum. mediastinum. Simple. And then this is the level. The heart. The heart is over here. So this portion is called as the superior. Below it is called as the inferior mediastinum. Tracheal rings, in case of trachea, the trachea, they are incomplete because that is the speciality of trachea. Right? No, no, ask immediately. Because, see, remember this. Once we have explained, we have understood any of the topic, as we'll proceed, we'll be taking that particular thing as a foundation. So, tracheal rings, they are incomplete because they are, they are called as the C-shaped tracheal rings because that gives the advantage that trachea can really expand. Right? If, if the entire ring is, this, these are the cartilaginous rings. If the entire ring is like tight, trachea just cannot expand. Just cannot expand because it is C-shaped. It has got scope of expansion. So, that's why, and that is the identification mark of C-shaped cartilaginous rings cartilage rings. That is the identification mark of a trachea. Right? Huh. Still in income. That's right. That's right. Uh, what to see space between the lungs because voice. Achha, achha. This is called as the media stenum. Media stenum. This is superior media stenum. And we have got similarly the inferior media stenum. Here it is, some important facts. Rib number one to seven, true ribs. They are vertebrosternal ribs. Right? So all the way, all the way from vertebra, they will be landing. From here is the vertebra, and here is the sternum. They will be landing. No doubt, there would be cartilage, but they will be reaching to sternum. Right? Even if there is cartilage, but that cartilage is also for that particular rib. Right? So here it is, this from rib number 1 to 7, their beginning is vertebra and their end is sternum. Rib number 8 to 10, they are called as the false ribs. False ribs. Their technical name, vertebrochondral ribs. Chondra means cartilage. Chondra means cartilage. Cartilage of what? Cartilage of seven. So here is the rib number seven, which is reaching all the way, all the way. Which is reaching like this, right? Which is reaching sternum. But then eight, then nine. Then 10, that's how they will do Just both, both are, both are. Just.
Covering is for both the lungs. Covering this pleura, it covers both the lungs, right? So got it? So that's why, that's why over here, see, when it goes, this is the thoracic wall. Right? This one is the thoracic wall. So the inner lining of the thoracic wall, and then it covers both the lungs, right? Covers both the lungs. So it is like all the way, all the way over here, here, here. See? And this is why this is called as right pleural sac. Right? This is where the right lung would be there. This is where the left lung would be there. Here there would be the heart. Right? So they both, both the lungs, they are fully packed. And yes, it is necessary because then and then the respiration is possible. Otherwise, the respiration won't be possible. They are very crucial. Okay. Bucket. We'll, we'll see that bucket. That's it. So that is limb number 8 to 10. They are starting from vertebra. Right? They are starting from vertebra, but they are ending on cartilage. So these 8, 9, and 10, they are ending on cartilage. So that's why they are also called as the false steps. And limb number 11, 12, they are floating. Right? Their ends are free. So they are called as floating or the vertebral ribs. So their end, posterior end is vertebra, anterior end is free. Least injured, rib number one and two, protected by clavicle. So this is clavicle, they are just underneath it. So in case if anything has to happen, the clavicle will break. Right? But ribs one and two, they won't be able, to, they won't be breaking that easily. And rib number 11 and 12, they are free to swing because only one end is there. And one end is there. So they, they can't be broken that easily. Second, if you really see that they are actually this small, so small, and they are so so properly, say, wrapped up in muscles, so they are not even affected frequently. Right? No, floating ribs, they are not supported from the front. They are they are free, right? They are, they are just having only one end on the back side. Just one end on the back side. They move with the respiration. So the ribs which are commonly broken are rib number four, four, five, six, seven, and seven, right? Because they are all the way connected. They are big ribs because that's how our chest is formed, right? Our chest is like this. So this is the area, right? Where the impact is there. So then these ribs, they are easily snapped off. We'll see the fractured x-rays also. So coverings of the thoracic wall. So, this wall is covered from superficial to deep, initially the skin, then there is a superficial fascia. So, fascia is a thin structure, right? Thin tissue. And then there is a deep fascia, right? Fascia means all those layers. And then we have got the muscles. Skin is anterior thin, posterior thin, right? The back side of the thin skin is thicker. Out front side of the skin is thinner. Cutaneous nerves, cutaneous nerves means those nerves which will be supplying to the, that particular skin. So this is the front, cutaneous branches of anterior primary. We have not yet talked about what is primary rami, right? Anterior primary rami, what? So, so right now, just think it like front is supplied by thoracic 2 to thoracic 6 and T6 at the level of Z5 process. In simple words, right? thoracic they are supplying front and the skin above the level of second rib is supplied by this cervical via supraclavicular All these things will come in anatomy. Right? So right now, cutaneous nerve, not that important. Similarly, anterior rami, this part is also, you can just let it go. It has got nothing to do with the physiology. Pure anatomy. So during anatomy part, we'll see. The concept, superficial fascia, this is dense on the posterior aspect of chest to sustain the pressure of the body, pressure of the body when lying in the supine position. So that is acting like a cushion. The skin is thick, fascia is thick, front of the chest contains breast or the mammary gland, which is rudimentary in males and well-developed in 
feelings because of the function of lactation, that formation of milk. Deep fascia, this is thin and ill-defined, except in pectoral region to allow free movements of the thoracic wall to be. So this is like this is skin. Then there is a thick superficial fascia, right? And then there is a deep fascia. And this deep fascia, then there are organs like lungs. So due to all these arrangements, the movement that becomes very smooth. Movement becomes very smooth. There is no friction. Heart beats, heart, heart keeps on beating for the whole life, for years and years and years, non-stop. Right? So the way lungs are packed in pleura, heart is also packed in pericardium. Right? So in, when it will be watching the heart, so we'll find that this heart is also covered by one layer. One layer. Heart is also well covered. So this is not giving much of the protection. It said that it gives protection, but protection is very thin. But there are two layers of this. There are two layers. And in between those two layers, this, these layers, they are called as the peri. Peri means surrounding. Right? And the cardium. Cardium means heart. The layer which is surrounding the heart is called as the pericardium. And then there is the space. Right? There, there, it's, these are the two layers. And in between two layers, there would be some space. Right? That is called as the pericardial fluid. This is filled with fluid. Right? So this is pericardial space. And then it is filled with fluid. So pericardial fluid. So that keeps everything so easy. Its heart keeps on beating without any friction. Right? There is no friction from any of the surrounding organs. So that's the reason. Muscles, muscles of the upper limb, important muscles, pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscles, they cover the front of the thoracic wall. Regarding this, I'll just take a minute for this. Pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. These are the very important muscles and you need to, when if you are going to gym, fine, you need to work on these muscles properly. In order to go, in order to develop these muscles, the biggest mistake which everyone does is, right, they will take heavy dumbbells and let's say if this is like chest fly, so then they'll, they'll, when you move out, right, when you move out, those who are into exercise or bodybuilding, in fact, it is true for everyone, male or female, right, when you move out, people do it, they, they do it fast and then, no, when you are taking it out, take it slow, take it slow because that is where the pectoral is major and minor, they will be involved. And then go for the slow movement. When you go for the slow movement, those muscle fibers, more muscle fibers will be involved and it will give you much better V-shape. Right? So that is just a side thing. When pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. Pectoralis itself means chest. Right? So this is a major muscle and the minor is just underneath it. Serratus anterior, these are the another Serratus anterior, serratus, that is because serratus name is because it is thrown into like this. This is like this muscle is. And they are called as the serrations. Serrations, ridges, right? As if it is that, uh, that knife right? with, the, with the serrations which can cut. So that is that there are, this is serratus anterior, so there must be another muscle called serratus posterior. Yes, it is there. That's why it is called. So these are the muscles which are present. Muscle of the abdomen, rectus abdominis. Right? We talked about rectus abdominis, the muscle of six pack, right, which is right in front. And then side muscles. Whenever you are doing crunches, right? Someone asked that how can I reduce the belly fat? Well, belly fat it cannot be reduced pinpoint. But yes, all those crunches when you, when someone is doing crunch, too many times. People do crunches like this, right? It gives extra stress on the neck. Do the crunch like this, do like this, and then do it. And you'll find that not only it is comfortable, but it will be more effective also. So over here, you are involving rectus abdominis, and when you do it sideways, so you are involving these obliques, right? So this is these are because these are the muscles of abdomen. Right? These are the muscles of abdomen. And so some if someone is having big tummy. So muscles, so they are there, but then there is fat, right? Then there is fat accumulated in that. In case of males, it is because of the hormones, the fat would be accumulated into the tummy 
in case of females you find the fat accumulation it occurs more on the sides and the and the buttocks right hip region so these are the major muscles muscles of the back that is trapezius and lats must draw right? during our discussion we just reduce their names we call trapezius as traps and lats must draw the as lats lats trapezius is this muscle right that's your neck so that's the trapezius right so these are the traps and when you are standing the v cut this v cut right that is the lats lats must draw that's the lats so when say now when i say that you are doctors you know that which muscles are important so if you do the exercise accordingly your structure will be much powerful right? so that's why for your whole life never never forget the anatomy right? you'll be able to design then this is levator scapula without knowing anything this is the scapula on the back side right this is the scapula Levator scapula. Levator means elevate. It's lifting. It is lifting the scapula, right? Rhomboidus major and rhomboidus minor. These are the muscles which are present over here. Right now, not much. These are the important muscles of the back. But this levator scapula, this traps and lats muscles. Traps means because it is its shape is trapezoid. Trapezoid. Its shape is trapezoid like this. And these are the lats must draw the big muscles which will be lying like this. Lying like this. I don't know if you have heard of kettlebell, which is basically a Russian exercise, right? Where it, it's not even that costly. Also, it is like a just iron ball, and then there is a handle, and then if you go for those Russian swings, so it will develop not only your chest but also the lats must start. Yeah, you know that, right? right? Kettlebells. So as your strength increases, you start going for higher and higher. Yeah, that is Russian. And and the best person, the Pavel Tosselai, right? He he was the person who was training the Russian army, the comrades. And his book that I got that book in case if you want, let me know. But that Pavel Tosselai's exercise, they are they are real tough. And if you are going for a higher version of the kettlebell. Then it is pretty strenuous, but as you develop, it develops so much of strength, right? That no one would easily dare to handshake with you. So, so this is these are some very amazing, things. not that cheap. And once you have purchased, means I mean I got twenty eight kilogram of kettlebell, purchased once it costed four thousand rupees, but it is with me now since ten years, and nothing can happen because it's nothing like movement, no mechanical part, right? Every morning you do that exercise with it and then put it back, and then no one would touch it. Then serratus posterior, serratus inferior, spine, all are present. Now these are the muscles. These are the intrinsic muscles. These are the intrinsic muscles that is inside. Right? This is external intercostal. External intercostal. This one. This is one rib. This is another rib. Right. So in between muscle. This is the external intercostal. External intercostal is superficial. Internal intercostal. This is another one, which is intermediate. And the deep is transverse thoracic. See the angle. Right. One would be like this. Another one would be like this. And transverse thoracic. Transverse. Such a beautiful mechanism. Because when the things are like this cross. Right when these are cross and then like this, so nothing can come out easily, right? Because these are the potential spaces, right? One rib, second rib, nothing will happen to those ribs. But in between space, if it is weak, the things can protrude out. So that's why the defense mechanism of the body is in such a way that nothing should come out. That's how it is protected. Right? Action, strong support for the rib, preventing their separation. Right? All the ribs they are bound together, so the whole chest moves as a single unit. The right? whole chest moves as a single unit. Then they act during expiration and the inspiration. Right, so during inspiration and the expiration, they will be elevator of the ribs during respiration. So that is the external intercostal. Awesome. 
all these muscles. So from this point onwards, right, we are taking it very fast because many of the part is is of the uh, anatomy. Right? But see, this is how all these, these muscles they are arranged. And by looks itself, see, and I'll just quickly keep on writing. This is transverse thoracis, the deepest muscle. So what we have tried over here is removed everything, right? And then from deep to third point, which third point? Transverse thoracis. Hi, that this is what we are watching. This one is the transverse thoracis. This one is the transverse thoracis muscle. So see, it is transverse layer. So the fibers, they are arranged like this. They are transverse layer. Then, so that is the deepest layer. And then, as we come out, this is, these are the, say, intercostal. These are the intercostal. See, between the ribs, this one. Intercostal. So these intercostal muscles, see how they are arranged all the way. This is internal intercostal. All the muscles show. This is internal intercostal. All of them. Then We move still further. See, see the ribs. Huh? This is this is the anterior end of the rib. See, it has been cut. Right? So this is all these, all these. Right? These are the anterior ribs. And over here, from here to here, there will be cartilage. Here to here, there will be cartilage. Here to here, there will be cartilage. So here, the cartilage is they have been removed. Well, these are not, I won't say these are the lectures for your assembly, but they can, you can consider it like lectures for your assembly also. So the reason behind it is very simple. In your assembly, they are asking for questions, for the questions which are absolute foundation. And in order to answer those questions, you just can't cram it, you need to understand the topic very well. Especially when in respiratory system, so many questions are asked. But they are based on these principles, what you are about, you are learning right. I won't say, because when you'll, when you'll be coming to USM, the speed would be phenomenal. The speed would be phenomenal. You straight away be going for the points and into the details of how to diagnose a case. Over there, no one would be asking whether external intercostal is superficial or internal. No one would be asking such question. Okay. So then, now we are Talking about this is the external intercostal, external intercostal muscles. Then see this, the muscles over here. This is, these are the muscles which are re really creating the ridges when, when, when you are standing, right? So those ridges on the upper side, this is the serratus and Serratus anterior. Serratus means as such, but I will RE, right? With what they cut. So that is the serratus. They are called as the serrations. So serrations. So that's that's what is called as the serratus. Then this is like once the muscles are there. See, this one is pectoralis minor, very nicely seen. I just highlight. See this so nicely. This one, this one. See, this is pectoralis minor. Not very easy to develop this pectoralis minor. It's like Arnold or anything, but then that's a different thing. But otherwise, very difficult. But yes, it gives. It has got several advantages. There are specific exercises also for that. This yellow thing, what is marked is. That is the membrane. It means these muscles, once the muscles are like, no, it's not so that straight away the skin is applied. They are covered by the membrane. So this is that membrane. That membrane. 
So to keep them absolutely separate. So when one muscle is contracting, in between the membranes are there. So everyone can contract in their own compartment. No need to say, right? This is the back major. That is the pectoralis major, the major, the most important, biggest muscle. Intercostal spaces, they are between two ribs. Right? Third to sixth, they are called as the typical intercostal spaces. So blood and nerve supply, they are restricted to thorax. So that's how all these. In this, just understand that in the intercostal spaces, there would be vein, there would be artery, there would be nerve. That means intercostal vein, all are intercostal. Intercostal vein, intercostal artery and intercostal nerve. Remember it like van. So it is the van from above downwards and it is in the upper half. What does that mean? The technical part is this. Small piece of info. This such question they do ask. If you if you take a rib, so the lower lower end of the rib is having a ridge. There is a ridge. There is a space, right? And through that space, this bundle is passing. Vein, artery, now they are passing. So it means it is this area, this area, through which all the vein, nerves, and arteries are passing. So this, it is this area, right, where we will find vein, artery, and nerve. Or the top vein, then the artery, and the nerve. So this means that nerve would be passing through this point. And over here, this is where the nerve is passing, right. Now, if you want to do some instrumentation into the lungs, so for example, you want to take biopsy, and you want to put the needle in. Now, when, when the needle is to be put in, so you have palpated that, right? That this is, this is, let's say, fourth intercostal space, and then you want to do it. What if while inserting the needle, this nerve is damaged? Right? It would be a big problem. So that's why, because space here, so we have created so much of space. As such, space is not this much, it is quite less. So the safest thing is what? Safest thing is, you palpate the rib, this is the rib, and just immediately above the rib, that is the area of instrumentation. Your needle should be passing through the point which is just above the rib. So above the rib, that means this is the intercostal space, right? Intercostal space. So when we say intercostal space, so the area of instrumentation, area of instrumentation is the lower half lower half of intercostal space or the upper part, right? Upper part of the rib, right? So we talked about that what is this area? This is, so just remember that vein, artery and nerve, they are passing through the, low, through the lower part of the rib, correct? Upper part of the rib doesn't contain vein. So vein, vein, artery, and now they are on to the lower part of the rib. So that's why don't even touch, don't even touch the upper half of intercostal space. Right? So this space is not to be touched. So that's why always take this area. So this is the green area. This is the green area. This can, can be utilized for any of the operations. This is the area, this is the safe area. Clear? 
to remember this very important point. Yes, in US Embassy, they ask you such a question. So read the question carefully. Are they talking about upper part of the rib or are they talking about upper part of intercostal space? Because answer would totally change, right? Upper part of the rib is safe and the lower part of intercostal space is safe. Because every rib, remember only one thing, every rib, its lower end has got that ridge, that space, right? There is, there is a space, rib skin, right? And in that, MCQs, somebody needs MCQs, right? So we have got intercostal vein, intercostal artery, intercostal nerve, but don't be, don't be, say, misled by that it is, it is uh, MCQ. You will be given the complete clinical history, right? Complete clinical history. Then lab test. Then there would be certain other point. There would be X-ray. And then it is said that, okay, diagnose, what is this condition? So even if you are given four conditions, right? Those four conditions, they'll be so similar. Like mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation. I totally agree this is MCQ, but this is a full theory question. You, should, you need to know the diseases so well that you should be able to, what is called, it's the differential diagnosis. Right? Differential diagnosis. That is what is needed. You need to differentiate between them. Right? <laughs> So, so that's why it is said that in US, I mean, you just can't cram. You need to understand when when we'll be learning immunology, right? That immunology is is a deadly thing. Deadly. When we talk about all the complements all the way from C1 to C9, you talk about all the ant antibodies from IgG, A, G, IgG to all the way G, A, N. They are so important. Then histo, multiple histo compatibility. Complexes and then the hypersensitivity reactions all the way one, two, three, four. That is in one most dangerous. I I I explained. I I mean yesterday. Huh, yesterday only I was talking about that. See this major histocompatibility object and the and the hist this uh, hypersensitivity type one reaction. Type one reaction is what type one reaction is allergic. Allergic reaction, which is, comes immediately, and it is because of IgE right? antibody E. But when I I saw the movie Border, I think you must have seen the Border. Today it is a, it is like a, such day also to talk about the movie Border. In Border, do you remember that when when that said that Sahab, up is Pakistani army ka yaar. This was one of the very important that they will go and but then they'll strike back. So be alert. This is exactly what I said to my US Amelia students yesterday. I said that in type 1 allergic reaction, there are one phase, one phase. This is what is called as the early phase. In early phase, initially there is sensitization and then there is an attack. So this early stage in which there is anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock means there is bronchus part. The person is when, when the patient the patient is unable to breathe, right? He is swell, right? Eyes, face is red, there are good swelling, he is unable to breathe. You give antihistaminics, you give corticosteroids, you give epinephrine, everything under control, you feel happy. And classically, it happens like person has gone to say a, a park, and then there is a bee, bee, bakhi. Right, Madhumakhi or any of the Makhi, or he smelt something and his patient is admitted at 8 o'clock in the night. And you wow. treated that patient, and by 9 30, patient is settled. You feel like, yes, he's good. The grave mistake, the biggest mistake, you tell that, okay, now you can go home. Don't let him go home. Never. Or if he's admitted into the ward, right, keep an eye on this. Keep an eye on this. Because it happens like after. Six to eight hours, even if there is no antigen, right? Antigen has been removed, that the cause, the toxin has been removed, there would be the attack of lymphocytes, they will be coming back. And at six to eight, after six to eight hours, when it is the late phase, that late phase is so dangerous that there would be massive bronchospasm. You need to attend this patient at that point. 
if it is failed next morning, you won't find that patient alive. Right. So I explained them, but because I made a blunder, so the blunder in the form of that those those students they were from nine countries, and few of few of them they were from Pakistan. That's okay. I said that. Don't take it me wrong. Yeah, allergy can kill a patient. Yes, allergy can kill. It is called as the anaphylactic phylactic shock. It's called as anaphylactic shock. Because the major thing which is released is histamine. The histamine on lungs. Yes, it will it would come in our, our discussion also. That in lungs, when we'll be discussing, there are H1 receptors. H1 receptors, these are present on the bronchus. So when H1 receptor is stimulated because of histamine, so that histamine will lead to massive bronchospasm. That is one. And second, all the smooth muscles of the vessels, they are constricted. Right? So there would be the vaso, there would be the severe constriction. Right? And another thing, say the endothelial space, that becomes widened. So from here, the fluid comes out. Now, articaria, that is also one of the Right? And the fluid comes out, it leads to massive edema. So all those things are to be treated. That's why the treatment is antihistaminics, corticosteroid, because it will take away into those uh, inflammatory components in the form of cytokines. And the third thing is the epinephrine. Epinephrine is to be given intravenously or intramuscularly so that blood pressure and everything comes back to normal. But this is this is what reminded me of border. This is the early phase and the late phase. So, uh, what you are talking, what you have asked is the back swells of the lines. This is the local effect. Right? Local effect. It is not the systemic effect. Sometimes it is. It can be because of hypersensitivity, hypersensitive skin also. So these are these are like spinal nerves, anatomy parts. So, so we just take let the huh. in coronary artery disease, the cardiac pain is referred along these nerves to the medial side of the arm. This is we'll, we'll discuss when we talk about the cardiology. That is when there is this the when there is pain on the left side of the heart, that is on the area which is just above the heart, it's called as the precordial pain. That precordial pain, it can go to shoulder, right? It can go to the medial aspect of the of the arm, or it can go on the posterior aspect that is on to the scapular region up to the inferior angle of scapula. So all these these are called as a referred pain. And referred because the cardiac pain is referred because it will be going along the nerves, the nerves which are over here, right? So because of all the structure. This we'll understand when we talk. Thoracic abdominal, right, root pain, garden pain, right, all those abscesses, why they occur. So, and then these are the posterior intercostal, right? these are all intercostal branches, which are the root, which are the branches from where they come. Simple, right? This is the descending aorta, and it is the descending aorta from where the branches are coming. They will be at this. this is coronary artery disease you are talking about, CAD. You are talking about coronary artery disease? Ha ha, I will be sharing this. So I will be putting it to our, our common friend. So this is all, all how this azygous, hemiazygous or these veins are formed. We come to this part now. Mechanism of respiration. Now, in mechanism of respiration, inspiration and expiration average 18 per minute. It could be lower. High in children, low in it. Inspiration, the volume of thoracic cavity, it has to increase. Last time we talked about the volume of thoracic cavity. So, that's why anteroposterior and, and the side to side. That is the transverse. Negative intrathoracic pressure. So, air sucked into the lungs. Simply, chest is there. If you expand, so now the pressure inside would drop, so air would drip, air will go in. 
and then when you compress the chest, so air would go out. You have to do this thing on, on chest. Right? You don't have to worry about the lungs because when, when the chest is expanding, because of the pressure, the air would go in and will expand the lungs. And when the chest is compressing, right, lungs, so as such, they are in, interested in getting collapsed. So without any effort, they'll be happily, they'll be collapsing, so lung air will go out. So cavity of thorax increased in three ways, vertical, anteroposterior, and transverse. First, vertical part, this is the easiest thing, and that is because of the diaphragm. Right? The root of thorax, tough suprapleural membrane, it cannot this above part, right? It is, it is quite tough. It, it cannot move. Right? Because the structures which will be passing, when we'll be learning anatomy, the structures which will be passing through supramembrane, membrane, it, it is all, all like a tough structure. Right? Now nothing can be moved. Floor, this is moved, right? Floor. That is by the diaphragm. So diaphragm can easily move. So that's why when the diaphragm goes below, when the diaphragm goes below, they say pet me hawa baro. The logic is that pet me hawa kaha se jai. Anyone tells ke pet me hawa baro. You know, sometimes they say, when, when we say, when we breathe in, the air is going into the lungs only. But because the lungs are expanding, so that's why the diaphragm is going down. Diaphragm is going down. So that's why the, the stomach contains, right, pet kula. Because diaphragm has pushed the abdominal contents. That, that's how the pet Ha, diaphragm makes that tongue out right? because the abdominal structures, the, the GIT structures will be pushed because it cannot go back. Back is very firm, thick muscles. So only it is the anterior bit where it can be able to go. So that is one easy to understand. This one is the second one, the AP diameter, anteroposterior diameter. Sternum moves up and down. So this is the sternal end. This is the sternal end. And this is the vertebral end. And in between, it is the fulcrum. Fulcrum means this is tubercle of the rib. Tubercle of the rib means the rib is connected at two points with the, with the vertebra. Right? Here it is. This is and that's the transverse process. And the rib would be like this. right? So it will be connected to the body and it will be connected over here. And then it goes forward. So this point, this point, it acts as a fulcrum. This is called as tubercle of rib. Right? So with that, this vertebral end, this is the short posterior. A small movement on the vertebral side. A small movement on the vertebral side because of the principle of liver, there will be big movement on the opposite side. So big movement on the opposite side. As I watch so many movies, many times I keep on relating. Because the moment I explain this, it reminds me of 36 chamber of Shaolin, right? In in which in the fourth chamber, right, when he picks up the picks up the weight, and they said that the weight is only one kilogram. He said that weight is not one, one kilogram. It is how much you perceive. So from here there is a long rod. So when you are lifting it from this end, right, this this weight, which is a one kilogram would become 50 kilogram. That's the principle of principle of that liver. Correct. Not this liver, right? This liver. So this is see, this is how they are connected. The rib, it is connected with the body. And this is with the transverse process, right? This one. So that is that is what is called as the tubercle. It's called as the tubercle. This one. Tubercle. And then the whole rib is. Right? So posterior arm is short, and the arm is long. So vertebrosternal ribs are involved one to seven, obviously. Rest of the ribs, they won't be involved. Because rest of the ribs, eight, nine, ten, they are connected with the, with the heart. So they are vertebrochondral. So in this case, only the vertebrosternal ribs, I mean, no one will ask you in this material, but it is the vertebrosternal ribs, that is rib number one to seven, two ribs, only they are involved into the increase in AP diameter. 
increase in the APR. Because they are connected with the sternum. So when they lift the sternum, there is increase in the APR. And then it is only 1 to 7 which are connected and no one else. Right? Just the explanation. Right? So slight movement at vertebral line is magnified at anterior end of ribs. This is how you, you cut with the scissor. This is how you work with the pliers. Right? When we do the pliers and when we move, so a slight movement over here, but on the opposite side, there is a big movement. Right? Because they, that is the advantage. And, and the bigger the distance, higher the advantage. So scissors, etc. Yeah. So here it is. As the ribs move, as the ribs move, here it is. The, as the rib gets elevated, so this sternum it gets up. So thus AP diameter is increased and this is what is called as the pump handle movement. So sternum is the handle of the pump. So here, right, this much is movement. Right? When we move the handle, we just move it like this because we really want that this much, this portion should be up and down. Because over here, we want to suck the water and that water should be pointed out. So here we want to generate the pressure, right? So principle of pump is different. So that's why over here, it is the, it is the, it is the handle of the pump. That is it. It is the handle of the pump. So the part which moves more, right? The part, this part which moves more, so this is the sternum. The next third one is the transverse diameter. Transverse diameter, that is the pocket. So the fact middle of the shaft of the rim lies at a lower level than the plane passing through the two ends. Simply speaking, simply speaking, the rim, it is over here, right? This is the, the I should like this. This is the rib. Right, but the ribs they are like if I now show you they are like this. So the level which is passing through anterior and posterior, that middle part is lower than that. So if it is like this, say this is the vertebral end, this is the sternal end, and this is the middle of the rib. So middle of the rib is at a lower lower level. So middle, this is the fact. Middle of the shaft of the rib lies at a lower level than the plane. And that's why the bucket, it can be raised, right? So that bucket handle, that can be raised. Bucket handle, that can be raised. But that's the principle. So then the plane passing through two ends. And this is in vertebrochondral ribs. Okay. So 10 ribs. But because see, they will be ending at a lower level. So there is increase in transverse diameter. So these are the muscles which will be acting. And the point to understand is this. That is for the quiet respiration. And in quiet respiration, in the expiration, this is passive. No muscles are used. Deep respiration. So over here, expiration, again, there is no muscles are used. So even if you take deep breathing but the expiration is normal nothing but when there is forced respiration you want to breathe out forcibly then the muscles are to be used these are the list of all the complete muscles to understand it we need one thing when you take deep breath or when it is forced one when it is a deep breath then the entire chest is to be elevated so that's why there will be use of intercostal muscles because they'll be lifting the lower ribs. Right? So everyone will be lifting so all thing goes up. And the sternocleidomastoid, scalene muscles, we talked about it last time, right? The muscles which are over here. So from neck, the neck, neck is fixed, so they will lift the entire chest up. Right? Serratus posterior from the back side, diaphragm, levators, costarum, all these muscles, right? they are for the Inspiration. Forced respiration, that is the levator scapula. And when you are you want to breathe very hard, so then it is like deliberately you do it. Right? When you do it deliberately, so that means the scapula is also lifted. Right? The entire levator scapula, trapezius, rhomboidus, pectoralis, everyone is involved. 
So that is for the day. For the expiration, it is intercostal, transverse thoracis, the serratus posterior, see serratus posterior anterior. Over here, this was serratus anterior and this was serratus posterior. Simple. When the chest is to be lifted, right? When the chest is to be lifted, so at that point, these, these are the muscles which are superiorly situated. Serratus, post, serratus anterior is upper, serratus posterior is back. Two components, serratus posterior superior, it will be lifting from posterior, from, from, from above. Serratus posterior inferior, it would be pulling it from the back, down, it will be pulling it down, right? So that is for the post expiration. Because when you want to make, take the chest down forcibly, so these are the different types in the muscles. Expiration, passive process by elastic recoil of alveoli. This will be our, our next time's topic where we'll be discussing about all the pressures, and all the pressures in advance. That is when you take a straw and when you drink something. So what is happening? What, how that negative pressure is burning? Because that would be the foundation of all the new effects and, and other structures. So this is the elastic recoil of the alveolar of the lungs. Alveoli, they, they, they expand and then they compress by themselves. The relaxation of intercostal muscles and diaphragm, that is true. An increase in tone of the muscles of anterior abdominal wall. The abdominal wall contracts. So that is also, that is how the passive process works. And when the muscles are relaxing and the lungs are collapsing. Quiet, deep and forced. The quiet movements are normal. In deep movements are increased. First rib is elevated by scalene and sternocleidomastoid, and in forced all movements they are excited. All these muscles which are used. So clinically, posture of patient during asthmatic attack when the patient is having asthma, patient is unable to breathe properly. So he'll be most comfortable on sitting up, leaning forward, and fixing the arms of the chair. The classical appearance will be this. This is like a spot diagnosis. If someone is breathless, you will not find that he's sitting. He's sitting like this. Right? And he'll be folding his head and leaning forward. Reason why it is like this. In the sitting position, the diaphragm is at its lowest level. When the diaphragm is at its lowest level, so there would be the maximum ventilation because diaphragm is low, so there is more space. So lungs, as such, he is asthmatic. As such, the bronchi, they are narrowed. So whatever the air which is coming, so it is coming and giving more oxygen, right? So, so that fixing of arms, they fixes the scapula so that pectoral muscles and serratus anterior act on ribs to elevate. So when you do it like this, so the backside, the backside, that levator scapula, that is fixed. So it is now pectoralis major, minor, and the serratus anterior. They will lift the ribs because see the position is like this. So Obviously, the whole chest is already lifted. The chest is lifted. That means so there would be increase in the diameter, and and the diaphragm is lowered. So patient will be most comfortable in this position. If patient is in bed, you know how these patients will be. They'll take a big takia. They'll be putting like this, or they will take the that food table, right in, in the ward. So that they will be leaning on that and they'll be they'll be sitting like this at night when there is they are breathless, so they'll be sitting like that. So this is the posture. This is the posture. Sitting up, leaning forward, and fixing the arms on the chair or table. That's how they will be sitting. So done. That's it for the day. I'll I'll put this file. Onto our shared folder. Okay. So thanks a lot. Whatever is left out, I will be covering even that. So thank you so much. Wish you a great. Yeah, happy. How to grow calf muscles? For calf muscles, I tell you one very fantastic.
uh, it would cost you slightly. There are there is a very simple device available where there is a there is a metal thing over here, right? and, and, and right? it, it is either wood or plastic, but wooden is better. I use that wooden part. And and so when you stand, when you stand, so your feet would be your feet would be like this. Your feet would be like this. It is said that you you just stay like this only, and as, as you stay, as you stay stand, right, it would be generating tremendous load on calf muscles. And as you elevate it more and more, right, it will be generating more pressure on the calves. Now, this, there is one reason. I think all the females would be very much interested. You know how, why females wear those, those high heels? When they wear those high heels, their calf muscles, they look very means can't use that word right now, but they look very sensual, right? So, and then the calf is one of the area which is considered as very exotic. So, this is the reason that those high heels, they put extra load on this. Now, in this process, it will also generate immense pressure on the, on the arches. These are our foot arches. So, at times, they will be, you'll find that they'll be having that pain, pain in the heels, pain in the these, this region. But what they say is that it's okay. They say that it is like a deal, looking good and the pain. So that's why those high heels, they, they do cause lots of problems. But over here, when we are exercising, it is for only three, four minutes, like that much more. Oh, so many questions. Left hand due to chest pain. Pain in left hand due to chest pain. Get it, get it diagnosed properly. Uh, I can't answer it just in one word. If there is pain in left hand and then it is associated with chest pain, first thing, go for x-ray and go for at least ECG. Reduce chest. Localized fat cannot be removed. Restrict the carbohydrates and do powerful exercises, especially the weightlifting, boxing. So they, they use lots of calories and not only that, they, be, they give what is called as the after effect. That means even if you have stopped the exercise, still your body will be feeling warm. That's it will keep on burning the calories. That could be if you have not exercised and, and then there is pain and cramps in foot. Right? So, so the reason could be multiple. One, it could be the potassium loss. Right? Potassium loss. And in case of females, many times it occurs if they are around their periods because the electrolyte imbalance is there. So you can that could be the reason in case of you. No, 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 no. Don't go for this home ready. Don't, don't go for this home ready. Every time home ready remedy is, is even think about. Get the things properly. You are a doctor. So get things properly done. Especially if the age is more. So you can't just go for home. Ah, if, if it is like just a muscular pain, so I would say okay, just chalo, you apply apply this massage oil and then some eucalyptus oil, etc. When it is elderly patient, no, for calm. How do you call it? On the age of 18, then do all those stretching exercises. Must hang right. hold hold it yeah. and swing so that will make the abs also. This is this is good even for everybody because we have got tendency of say SA So unnecessarily the spine is up. 
when you stand straight, you hang, right? you do all those pull-ups, so physical structure as well as your posture, that would improve. So that would add extra one inch. Any of the left, left sided chest pain or hand pain, unless you know that otherwise if it is nothing like that, I won't suggest any of it's like home remedy. Why? Why? Better get it diagnosed. It will cost how much? One X-ray and one ECG that cost you hardly hajar barasu. But you will come to conclusion and in ECG, the ECG is so vital, especially in the ECG. Don't ignore it. One of my very good friends was the manager in HDFC bank. My, my, he was my marathon buddy. At the age of 43, he passed away. We met on, met on Friday. He said, said tomorrow we'll go for a run. I said, yeah, yeah. And I waited for him. He didn't come. I went for my run. When I returned, I thought that let me call him. He didn't pick the phone. I said, koi baat nahi. Baat. Next, next day was Sunday. Monday, I went to the bank and then I found his chamber was empty. I said, you can't some expire. He passed away on Saturday. Saturday, early morning. He was having pain. He was having so many things. Like, he was uncomfortable since Friday. Back in the Friday afternoon, I said that, Japan, are you okay? He said, ha ha, sir. Fine, fine. Calm ka tension jada hai. He never told me that he is having that pain and he is having some heartburn and everything. Passed at the age of 43. That's why the things are like, don't take it lightly. The best is get diagnosed properly. Get diagnosed properly. Once you know that things are good, you can feel choker now. Alright. So thanks a lot and take care. If there be surgery medicine, how can I come? How can I come in without diagnosis? How is it possible? Whether it is surgery or medicine, it purely depends upon the Okay, so take care. See you.